Okay, this is going to be a relatively short lecture uh, today. Um, I just wanted to expose you to uh, continuing with some concurrency features in other languages. So I want to briefly mention concurrency in C sharp. Um, this is not going to be a full in-depth treatment of this, uh, but I just want to get through a few things today. One thing to keep in mind uh, next week, uh, we probably won't have any other uh, lectures. I will, however, post the uh, study guide for the final. I'll have a little uh, video where I talk about the final exam. Uh, the final exam will be as scheduled in the official uh, schedule. And next week, uh, I'll give you time to finish up any labs that you're working on, ask any questions that you have, uh, and go through the study guide. So that's what we'll be doing uh, next week. And uh, hopefully you've you've learned a lot. I might do a little bit of a, a video on kind of summarizing things and finishing up some stuff with concurrency uh, as well. But as far as actual lecture content, um, new content, uh, today is going to be it. All right, so let's dig into the stuff I wanted to get through today. So today, uh, first off, there's several ways to achieve uh, concurrency in um, C sharp. Uh, there's the option of multiple threads, you can have multiple processes, you can have, uh, there's some fe special features for parallel programming, there's a parallel invoke, which is essentially a way to make multiple processes uh, be spawned from functions like you would with threads. Uh, there's also a, a couple parallel uh, language constructs as a parallel for each and a parallel for loop construct, uh, which essentially allows you the a way to tell C sharp, hey, these things that are inside of this loop, those aren't necessarily required to be sequential. You can actually spread those out across each of those actions uh, across multiple um, cores. Uh, and those can actually be um, pretty useful. Uh, also, there's support for asynchronous programming, meaning there's an async and await uh, feature, just like there was in Python when we looked at that. And then there's also a thing called reactive programming where it allows you to handle what are called observable stream events. So you have the stream event when data comes in. Uh, it, it's sort of like event-driven programming, uh, but you're reacting to this data that might stream in, and you might one of those events might be the end of the stream, so you close down. But that can be useful for streamed data. Um, as data comes in, it needs to be processed, it needs to be handled. Uh, and rather than having a thread that sits there and is constantly looking for that stream data coming in, reactive programming gives us a way to do that. And we're not going to go through all of these. I just want to focus a little bit today on um, multiple threads and some of the synchronization features that are available to give you a, a rough overview of that. But if you're interested in this, at the end of the lecture, uh, if you're interested in looking at some of these other ones, I put a link in there um, to the Microsoft documentation. Uh, so you can browse through and look at some of the other things. Now, one thing to keep in mind, as always, with any sort of concurrent execution, any sort of concurrent uh, behavior in any kind of system, we have to be careful and make sure that we uh, use synchronization where appropriate and inter-process communication where appropriate. Okay, so let's look at multiple threads. All right, to, so to span uh, multiple or to spawn multiple threads, uh, we're going to use the, a namespace that's part of the, the C Sharp kind of standard installation called system.threading. And that system.threading namespace has uh, several classes in it that are useful for concurrency and concurrent control. Uh, for example, the thread class is there, which allows us to create threads, control those threads. And then we have some of the traditional things that we're used to saying mutex. Uh, there's a mutex class, there's a semaphore class. Uh, there's a timer class, and then there are other ones in there as well. Uh, similar to what we saw in Python, there's a lot of analogous um, classes that we can use to make instances from to uh, do things with. Now, to create a thread, we first need to import system.threading, uh, that system.threading namespace. So at the top of our code, uh, we would have those imports, and it would look like, well, here's our using system. And then we would also have to say using system.threading. This is equivalent to the import um, that we used in Python. But in C-sharp, you're going to say use that namespace. 
So now that we've imported it, we can actually use the classes that are inside of this. And since we use the using keyword to import that, we don't have to say system.threading.thread or whatever every time. We can just use the things that are inside there because we've essentially opened that namespace and we're using it in our uh, current application. So to create a thread, we need to have some non-static method to be executed uh, within a thread. So in other words, something like a function needs to be called. But in our case, it, that could be a method that's uh, in a class. But if it, ha if it is in a class, it needs to be, uh, uh, well, it needs to be a, either a static method or if it's a non-static method, it needs to be, have, be instantiated. It needs to be from an object that actually has an instance. So in other words, it can't just be, uh, uh, think of the idea of a class as a blueprint. We can't call a function in the blueprint. We have to actually make an instance of that so that code lives in memory and then call that. So it could be either a static method or if it's non-static, so maybe I should say, in that previous thing, I shouldn't say, need a non-static. Maybe we should say something more like a static method or instantiated non-static method. And so that's essentially creating something that's going to behave uh, like a function uh, for us. And it has to be in memory somewhere. So here, uh, to create the thread, we're going to need that. And here I have non-static again. We'll just say that. So we have that um, uh, code. It needs to live in memory somewhere. So it needs to be a static method. Or it needs to be uh, in a class that then has an instance. And that the example I'm going to do is I'm going to use the static method example. So here, for example, we're making this public class called MyThread. And inside of that class, we're making uh, this thread1 method. And all it does is count from 0 to 100 uh, and print out 1 every time. So console.writeLine, we're writing out a 1. So this is going to print out 100 ones on the screen. So now we can create a thread uh, in our main uh, program over here. So here's my example main public class. Here's my main. This is equivalent of the main function that we would have in something like C. And so this is going to execute on startup. And notice what I do is I just use the thread class to make a thread called thread1. So this is just like a variable type here, So except we're making a thread called thread1. And we're making that a new and then we're calling the thread class here, which is going to create an instance of mythread.thread1. So we're making a new thread, and we're passing to it this function uh, reference, mythread.thread1. If we go back a page, mythread, and then the method, thread1. And since that's static, it's OK to pass that to this because it actually lives in memory because it's a static method. And we're saying static create a new thread called that. And then over here, this is now having this thing, thread one, as a reference to that new thread that got created. Now, once that thread is created, uh, we can start it by saying thread one dot start. And thread one dot start will actually change that thread uh, to a state where it can actually be scheduled and can get CPU time and be executed. So one thing to note, uh, just like I mentioned earlier, it says the method passed to thread right here to the thread constructor has to be a static method uh, of some class or has to be uh, a method that comes from an instance. In other words, that code has to live in memory. It can't just be in the blueprint of the class. And the same thing is, uh, is essentially true for, for Python as well. You have to pass the reference to that function or a reference to a method to uh, the to the uh, thread constructor in order to create that thread. So same kind of thing here, uh, a little bit um, different just because of the way C Sharp uh, organizes things and doesn't really have functions per se. Um, but this will create that new thread and start it. The other thing to note here is that threads are not automatically started when we create them. In other words, when we create a thread, it isn't running. It's in a pause state until we tell it to start. Again, same thing with Python. We have to start that thread. So to do that, we just use the dot start 
method of that thread. So we create it here and then we start it down here. Uh, note that this is different from what we saw in C and C++ where when you create a thread, it kind of automatically starts it. Uh, in this case, we have to explicitly start it to have it be started. Okay, now uh, joining a thread, uh, thread1.join, that waits for the thread to complete. Uh, blocks and waits for the thread to complete. So in other words, this will start thread1. Uh, thread1.join will block, wait for it to finish. Again, analogous to what we saw in Python, analogous to what we saw in pthreads and C++ previously. All right, so here's a complete example. Uh, and let's uh, just quickly walk through this um, complete example here. So the, with this complete example, essentially what we're doing, uh, what we have is the, the top part using system.threading that gets access to that namespace. And then down here we create this mythread class just to hold uh, my thread function or method. In this case, I created two. I made thread one and thread two as two separate methods inside of the mythread class. And now we're going to start both of those concurrently and wait for them to finish. Let's go to the next page. So next page here, continuing on, we have the main uh, uh, method. And inside of there, I create two threads, T1 and T2. I start both of them, T1.start, T2.start, and then T1.join, T2.join. So I start them both, wait for them to complete. Now what's interesting is if I were to have code here, where the, between the start and the join, I, I actually have three threads. I have the main thread, I have thread one, I have thread two, all running uh, concurrent uh, with one another at this point in time here. And then here when the main reaches this point, it's like I'm going to wait for T1 to be done, and then I'm going to wait for T2 to be done, and then I'm going to continue on. Now when we continue on, we could spawn other threads. This gives us a way to have uh, a single thread branch out, in this case, into three, the main and the other two and then converge again back down to one, and then continue on. We could branch out and have make more threads, uh, collapse down to more of them, and so forth. Now, one of the things about um, the C-sharp uh, threading is that just like the other things, because it is those threads are concurrent, we have a need for synchronization. And uh, C sharp has a mutex class and so we can create one. We can create a, a kind of one of these variables. In this case I made a private static mutex. It could be public. But this we use the mutex class and create a new mutex. And usually that's in our, our main. We would create this uh, um, mutex variable in our main that acts sort of like a global uh, at that point. But it would be if it's a a private static mutex or public static mutex inside of that main, it acts kind of like a global for that main um, kind of code object. So to use it, you basically uh, wait one is the how you acquire it, and then to release it, you call release mutex. Uh, the other thing is you could make multiple ones of these variables. You could have mutex one, mutex two, mutex three, however many you need. You can even create an array of mutexes if you needed that. Um, but the way that you uh, acquire that, just like a lock, the way you acquire it is with the wait one method. The way that you release it is with release mutex. Um, I'm not a real big fan of the way they named these methods in here, wait one and release mutex. Uh, I prefer like uh, acquire and release or something like that. Uh, a little more compact like mutex one dot release mutex, it's kind of redundant, but then up to here it's not acquire mutex, it's wait one, it just seems a little asymmetrical to me. But this is the way you do that. And then between the wait one and the release mutex, you have your critical section. So those uh, work pretty much like locks that we had seen previously. So anywhere you need to lock uh, something to access some shared resource, or uh, lock to wait until uh, something is released elsewhere. Uh, anywhere you're going to protect some critical section and want to enforce mutual exclusion, you want to do something like this around it. There are, of course, other options as well. Let's look at another one. Let's look at semaphores. Now, semaphores work essentially the same way. There is one difference, though, 
uh, that needs to be mentioned. And that's when you create a new semaphore, you can pass in um, these parameters, these function arguments, or I guess arguments to the constructor that says what's the initial value of the semaphore and what's the maximum value. So this is kind of like a bounded semaphore uh, in Python that we saw previously. So this semaphore object here, we're saying start it out with a value of five and make its max five, so it can never go above that. And then what's gonna happen is if I wanted a semaphore that just had one, I could put one and one, but if I put five and five, it's gonna allow five uh, threads to continue past the weight. And that's the essentially the P operator uh, that we saw previously with semaphores or proberin, which basically says, hey, if it's the value is greater than zero, subtract one and continue on. But if value ever gets down to be equal to zero, then we block uh, and wait. And what do we wait for? Well, we wait to be to, to be notified. How do we get notified? Semaphore.sem1.release. And you'll notice that's the equivalent of the V operator with in Dijkstra semaphores or Verhogen. And you'll notice that that release there, what it does is if somebody's waiting, it gives the lock, uh, the va semaphore value to them. If there's nobody waiting, it increments it. So if we started this at five and had five things enter a critical section and then five things leave that critical section, the value will be back to five again. So that works pretty much like semaphores we've seen previously. Uh, more specifically, it works like bounded semaphores. Uh, that we talked about uh, previously. Now, there are other concurrency uh, features available in C-sharp. There are barriers, there are monitors, there's timers, there's spin locks, there's thread pools. Uh, there's also those uh, um, uh, parallel execution, uh, parallel for, parallel for each, parallel invoke uh, that are useful to look at. And then there's the asynchronous programming with async and await that works very similarly to how it works uh, in Python. But if you want details about uh, how that works, um, consult that C Sharp documentation. I have a link to it here. So you can just click that, click through on that, uh, take a look at that. And that's, uh, notice that's .NET 5.0. But if you're doing anything, uh, any project, uh, that needs to be concurrent, I'd strongly advise taking a look at that documentation and looking at some of those other uh, concurrent synchronization and communication methods that are available there. Um, notice none of these really deal with communication, uh, but the ways of communicating are uh, available in there. And the parallel execution gets us away from just threads and into more of the multiprocessing uh, domain. Now, one other thing that I want to mention uh, that some of you, if you're in the game programming degree, uh, you'll likely want to look at some of the concurrency features of the game engine that you're using. And Unity, for example, it is, has C Sharp as its scripting language. And Unity uh, C Sharp has what they call the C Sharp job system. And that allows you to write multi-threaded game uh, tasks as part of your game scripts. And that can greatly simplify uh, certain game logic tasks uh, and allow for better performance because it allows your scripting code for your game to take advantage of multiple CPU cores. So rather than having just a linear uh, sequential uh, program, you can actually use that job system to farm things out into different jobs. Like this thing is going to handle uh, the enemy AI. This part is going to handle the uh, game logic of this uh, things that are moving around, maybe you have something that's dealing with the non-player characters or whatever. Um, but it, by do it, using that job system, it allows you to create tasks, you can give them priorities. Uh, maybe something graphical has a lower priority than something that's game uh, related, but I'd strongly suggest you take a look at that. Um, Unity also has support for uh, Parallel 4, uh, similar to the C-sharp. Uh, parallel for and parallel for each that we talked about before, but those jobs can allow parallel execution of different iterations of tasks. In other words, that a place where that might be useful is, let's say you have some sort of particle effects and there's a bunch of particles and you're writing the scripting for that yourself, or maybe it's a bunch of chickens that are running around and each chicken needs to have something done to it. You might say, you know what, it's okay to make this parallel. There's no reason to do chicken one, 
then chicken two, then chicken three, then chicken four. You say, just update all the chickens. And um, that job system can help with that kind of thing as well. So for more information on that, uh, I have a link here to the job system uh, as part of the Unity manual. Also, uh, one of the things that's even more used than that uh, that you should probably get pretty familiar with if you're going to program in Unity is Unity has support for uh, coroutines. And you're, if you remember, we talked about coroutines uh, as part of our asynchronous programming. And coroutines were, are uh, a method of concurrent um, multitasking, but it's cooperative multitasking, meaning that rather than having a thread have to deal with it, the job will run for a while, or that uh, coroutine will run for a while until it is in a state where it needs to wait or where it the programmer decides to allow it to yield, and then that will then switch to another coroutine and run it until it either waits or yields, and that will switch to another one and it'll run until it waits or yields. Because notice that it's a cooperative form of multitasking, but the place where that can be really useful um, is imagine some something like particle effects, where each particle needs to move, but it also is going to fade out slightly. So you have something like a spark that's existing and over its lifetime, it reduces the lifetime a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit, till its lifetime gets to zero. Or let's say it's reducing its transparency or increasing its transparency. So it's becoming uh, kind of fading out slowly over time as the spark exists until it go, goes away. Well, one way to do that would be to have some sort of uh, list of all of those and then iterate through them and subtract from it every time. But the nice thing about using something like a coroutine to have that fade out is the coroutine... The easy way to think about something fade, fading out would be like a for loop where you say, hey, take its opacity, reduce a little bit. Next time through the loop, reduce a little more. Next time through the loop, reduce a little more and just keep doing that until it's so transparent uh, that you want to get rid of it. And if you think about that in terms of something like particle effects, uh, you might think about it as uh, keep moving the particle and moving the particle and moving the particle until uh, it's no longer visible or until its lifetime expires and then we want to get rid of it. But if you think about a single particle inside of a for loop, that's an easy way to think about that. Move it, uh, reduce its trans or make it more transparent, move it, uh, reduce its transparency. But the problem with, with doing that in a script uh, like that, we just had a for loop, is it would block up the whole rest of the program running while that thing faded out. And so what or that while that particle moved. So you don't want to have an explosion where this particle moves and fades out and then this one moves and fades out and then that one. You want them all to kind of move together. But you might not want to create a thread for each one. And so one of the ways of doing that would be to use coroutines. And those coroutines can then say move it one space and then yield. And then move the next one a space and yield. So it's kind of allowing them to take an action. Uh, and one way to think about that, it's kind of like a uh, a while loop or a for loop that can continue where it left off without having to. Uh, so it makes it a natural way to program things like that, um, but can also peacefully coexist and have a lot of those things happening at the same time. And I would uh, suggest you maybe get familiar with coroutines. Uh, it's a very useful thing uh, to handle different kinds of tasks doing different things. And you can have some coroutines that maybe go on for a really long time but you don't want them to block the rest of your game logic from running. So there might be a really simple coroutine like, did they press the lock button yet? And if they didn't, then yield. If they press the lock button, then close this gate. And dividing things up into separate kind of event-based tasks like that could be uh, easier for the logic flow or the thought process than, um, than writing it in some other way. So look at coroutines. Here's the link to that. That's why I'd encourage you to look at that as well. And I wanted to come in at about 20 minutes, about four minutes over that right now. So go ahead uh, and look at those um, uh, URLs and the manual uh, information here. And we're not really going to have a uh, a a lab for any of this stuff, but I wanted you to have exposure to it and think about using that stuff. Um, again, concurrency is a really powerful thing, uh, really useful, but it comes with dangers, so we gotta be careful how we use it. Uh, so I would encourage you to look at 
uh, this stuff. Coroutines are a little safer because we get to control when they yield. It's not uh, like a thread where at any point in time the uh, control can get taken away. But coroutines can also be dangerous because if somebody writes a coroutine that never yields and it locks up the system, then you have uh, a problem. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, everybody stay safe. Uh, again, as always, if you're having problems with any of the labs, let me know. I, like I said, we will have the final at the normal time. Uh, next week, I will post the final exam study guide uh, along with all of the uh, an outline of all of the topics, uh, and I'll give you time. I will probably have a final lecture where I just wrap, wrap a few things up and talk about that final exam. Um, but other than that, uh, let me know if you have problems or questions, and I'll be happy to answer them, and I'll see you guys next time.